Welcome back to the Do Hard Things Today podcast. This is series. We are doing a series with Dr. Stephanie Morgan. Uh, if you were listening to our last podcast, we, if you haven't listened to it yet, I would encourage you to go back and listen. Uh, tons of great information, um, not only just talking about her journey of running and triathlon, but really turned into a quasi-parenting podcast, and we talked about <laughs> young athletes and how to manage manage them and, and just so many different things. So uh, we appreciate her being back with us, and we're going we're gonna to kind of shift gears a little bit. As always, we've got Jed Blackwell over there, the brains behind this operation. Coach Katie Malone, the ones that he, she asked the good questions, the ones that we get great information out of, and, and I'm here for entertainment purposes only. And now we have Dr. Stephanie Morgan, and we're going to talk about her professional life, which is something that I was, I was as most of you, when you hear the term pelvic health, she's with Limitless well, tell us who you're with. So I'm with Limitless Therapy and Wellness, and mm -hmm. we do Limitless Pelvic Health. So it's pelvic yep. floor physical therapy. Yep, yep. And so when you when you think about when you think about those words, what is pelvic health, and what is what does that mean? Give us a very very. We have some questions, and we're gonna we're gonna spend about thirty minutes going through this. But give us the Cliff Notes version of when someone asks you, because I'm sure you get asked this all the time, what, what is pelvic, what, what do you mean, what are you doing, Stephanie, what is pelvic health? Give us the Cliff Notes version of that, and then let's dig deep into it. All right, so I'll say that I'm a physical fit therapist first and foremost, so I went and got my physical therapy degree, uh, doctorate of physical therapy at MUSC, and um, went into the orthopedic sports medicine world because that's who I was, and I was an athlete, and I was going to treat athletes and do orthopedics. And then I got bored, honestly, and really burnt out. And I had my children. So I have a six year old and an eight year old and had vaginal deliveries with them. And I had some issues personally. And I was living in Spartanburg at the time and I needed to get physical therapy myself. And so I sought out a pelvic floor physical therapist. And I was like, this isn't going to help. This isn't going to do me any good. And went and saw her, and she was a wealth of information and something that I was just never taught in school of the pelvic floor muscles. So to me, pelvic health is anything that truly attaches to the pelvis. Mm. A, a good pelvic health therapist is going to be someone who assesses bowel, bladder, and sexual function, but as well as anything musculoskeletal that attaches to the pelvis. Spine, hip, pelvis, legs, of legs you know, range of motion, flexibility, strength, anything that involves that. They'll do a good external assessment, but they'll also potentially, if re patient readiness, can do an internal vaginal exam. And what that helps us know is just these muscles that attach from our pubic bone to our tailbone that help truly hold up all these organs, help hold up a baby that's in your uterus. Um, but we can't see these muscles. So the biggest thing is that when we as pelvic floor therapists who have done more certification can do an internal vaginal exam to feel these muscles. Are they tight? Are they loose? What happens when you squeeze? Are they strong or are they weak? Can they actually relax? Are they tender? Do they replicate pain that you have in your low back or in your sacrum and your tailbone or even into your hip? So that was my biggest thing was that I was having deep hip pain, but it was actually a tight muscle spasm that was within my pelvic floor that needed to be accessed from an intravaginal perspective. And so I personally went through pelvic floor therapy, was able to identify my pain issues that actually restricted me from running and then know the certain exercises, stretches, and breath work in order to be able to manage that internal pain. And then I just manage it from a day-to-day -day basis as needed now. So. so so they're in that core area and in the hips. And the, we talk about running a lot on this podcast, cycling, different things. And a lot of times you can get real bound up in that area. And so did, 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 did those muscles, when we talk about hip flexors, hips, your I guess your your glute muscles and all the are all do all these things play in together and does this have any correlation to pelvic health or I, I'm trying trying to understand get a get a perspective on this yeah so what I call your abdomen is kind of like a soda can so you have pressures within your abdomen that keep everything in line so at the top of the soda can is where your diaphragm is the bottom part of the soda can is your pelvic floor. The front part of around the soda can is going to be your abdominals or your deep core. And then in the back is going to be your lumbar paraspinals or erector spinae muscles. So they should all work in coordination with each other. If something is off in terms of 
weakness or tightness, that pressure system doesn't work well. Whether that is, okay, I get a diastasis recti, which is going to be a separation of the abdominals potentially during pregnancy or postpartum, or maybe I have a vaginal prolapse from the bottom part of the soda can that things fall through the vagina and we need to manage the pelvic floor component of it, but it's all a systems regulation. Then you'll have some folks who have, let's say, SI joint pain or low back pain, but it's actually a pelvic floor weakness issue or even a pelvic floor tightness issue that you just can't see. So, and then you've got all other of these things working together, whether you're running or cycling or swimming, you know, you're going to need all of these muscle groups to kind of all work in coordination together. So, so I, I, I've got to believe that the, how, how do you, how do people make their way to you? And, and what I mean by that is a lot of times we get pains and, and females get pains and if they're athletes or run or do different things, there's a lot of different avenues you're probably going to explore before you find yourself at, oh, I need to check my pelvic health. Right. Uh, how do people how do people find their way to you, and what should people be looking for to possibly explore? Like, hey, this may be this may be the root of your issue. Right. So I work for a company called Limitless Pelvic Health. And we are kind of an out-of-network cash-based clinic where you could actually just come off the street with, hey, I have some SI joint pain or I'm having some pelvic pain in my female population. I'm seeing a lot of women who have vaginal pain with penetration. So whether that's with inserting a tampon or um, intercourse or having a pelvic speculum exam, they're having a lot of pain with that. So a lot of times you actually don't have to have a referral in the state of South Carolina to see a physical therapist. So you can come off the street and say, hey, Stephanie, man, I've really been having a lot of issues with intercourse. Is that something we can talk about? Awesome. I talk about that all the time. Let's talk through this. Um, Or, hey, Stephanie, I have had a baby vaginally eight months ago, and I'm trying to get back to running, but I'm leaking um, whenever I run or whenever I cough or laugh or sneeze. Hey, let's talk about that. What are you drinking? You know, what are those muscles doing for you? So we we have a 90-minute assessment that we can do in terms of let's talk about your bowel, bladder, and sexual health, um, and then let's do a formal external to potentially internal exam to understand the root cause of what's going on because, you know, when you fall and you break your arm, you can see that. Mm-hmm. And you have pain with that. But a lot of folks, they're like, hey, I have abdominal pain, but I don't know where it's coming from. And so as pelvic health therapists, we can kind of zone in a little bit more about where this is actually coming from. And again, you can have a referral from your OBGYN, your urologist, your GI, your urogynecologist, um, your primary doctor. I think a lot of this is just bringing more awareness to pelvic health and what we can do to help even some of the primary doctors in this area to say, hey, there's actually some help out there for these women. You could be six weeks postpartum. You could be six months postpartum. You could be six years postpartum and still have problems, but be ready to start addressing those issues. And it doesn't have to be this long journey. It could be just a few couple sessions that get you back on track versus I have a lot of folks who have chronic pelvic pain, whether that's due to sexual trauma or something in their background that has made this a long journey for them. And it might be a more of a healing process for them. It might be more of a self-care component. So there is a lot of mental um, psychological help with that. There's a lot of breath work involved with that and a lot of calming down our nervous system. So that's something that I think that there's going to be two ends of the spectrum. You just want to be very intuitive as a physical therapist to know exactly what your patient needs in that moment based off of the symptoms that they're experiencing. Yeah. Coach Katie? Wow. I'm just uh, sitting over here, first of all, just completely disturbed about the whole vaginal exam part of it. Um, so I'm, I'm over here just cringing. I'm like, oh my gosh, sorry. I mean, okay. I am. Let's yeah. like, just keep it real because like, yeah. I didn't realize that was part of it. So I'm glad that we're talking about this because I would have been yep. real surprised okay. if I'd come in for an exam and been like, hello. Yeah. Um, so that's, I mean, like, that's kind of like, oh, that's, that's like major to me. And it's Sorry, not- Kevin, you can't appreciate that, but I can. 
but it's not something that we have to do, okay. but I think it helps us understand things. Yeah. And so when I tell people, when I do my exam, I'm going to do an external exam to understand everything from an external perspective. But if, in order for us to understand things a little bit better, I, I use, it's not a stirrup exam. It's not, I'm not using a speculum. It's a gloved one finger vaginal exam to feel the muscles. And right. a lot of times you'll find a lot of your athletes with deep hip pain or deep like SI pain can be re replicated from an internal perspective at obturator internus. Wow. And so a lot of folks who ha are high end athletes, they actually end up have and they leak. So a lot of people who say, oh, I'm leaking urine. I must have a weak pelvic floor. I tend to find that a lot of those folks actually have a tight pelvic floor that's really, really tight and actually won't ever let go to, f to have the full range of motion. So they actually have a tight and weak pelvic floor. That's so crazy. we actually have to get the muscle to relax and then we work through the range of motion. So people come to me and say, oh, I need to do Kegels because I'm leaking or I have to do Kegels because something's falling out of me. I'm like, well, what are those? What are those? I don't, yeah. I, you know, I hear about this all the time. Yeah. Like, oh, you got to do Kegels. I don't even know what they are. Can you tell us? Yes. Because so, I don't know. So Kegels to me, I never really actually use the term, but it's named after the gentleman who actually made the exercise is going to be a contraction of the muscles of the, the vagina or of the rectum itself. And I never use the word because I don't think it tells people what to do. So it's an exercise? So it's a muscle exercise that people will do to, and you squeeze like you're going to hold back urine or gas uh -huh. and you hold it for a certain period of time and then you let it go. So your primary doctor or urologist, whoever is going to say, oh, you just need to be doing your Kegels. And I'm like, what? You didn't tell them what to do. Wow. I thought it was some sort of torture device. I mean, seriously, I thought it was like a thing. I'm like, oh my gosh, what is this thing? Wow. Okay. And so we need to educate people on actually one, what are the muscles of the pelvic floor and yeah. what can they do for us? And so a lot of times, you know, I'll say, okay, we need to do a pelvic floor contraction, but what does that mean? That means, you know, squeezing like you're going to hold back urine or bring your pubic bone to your tailbone or hold like you're going to hold back gas. But a lot of times, and you guys are probably doing it right now as we're speaking, or if you're listening, you're like trying to contract those muscles, but there's a certain way to do that. And so that's where us as pelvic health therapists can come in and say, okay, let's one, assess those muscles to see if they're tight or weak or strong or loose or what tender or whatever they are. And we need to give you the appropriate exercises to work on that. Cause if they're tight, I'm not going to tell you to do a contraction when something's already tight. Right. So I'm actually going to tell you, let's work on lengthening and relaxation techniques to let those muscles relax. And then let's work through the range of motion in terms of coordination. That sounds really hard actually, like to get somebody to do that. Cause like, I don't even it does not sound easy. No. And I think there's a lot of verbal cues that us as therapists can use to help of course. Um, with that. And a lot of times, even just like internal tactile cues can make a big difference to actually know, oh, those are my pelvic floor muscles. And that's what I'm supposed to be using. Or, oh, I'm actually supposed to do this with a breathing coordination. So you're supposed to inhale, exhale, squeeze. As you breathe out, you're supposed to squeeze, but you're not supposed to hold your breath. <laughs> And okay. do these exercises, and I'm sure everybody's doing them now as we're sitting here. But you're supposed to let them relax because there's a difference between strength and length. And actually, you see a lot of folks who are in the running world who leak urine. They're like, oh, well, it's just a thing. But most of the time, those folks have tight pelvic floor muscles, not just you know, loose. Pelvic I've definitely muscles. heard that from women before. Like they're always like, oh, well, you know, some of them it was bad enough where it's like, oh, you you've got to go get help for this. Yes. Um. But I don't feel like until recently I started hearing like, oh, that's pelvic health. You've got to go, you know, you've got a weak pelvic floor. And I'm like, is this like the new catch all? Like, does everybody have a weak pelvic floor or problems with their pelvic floor? Like, really, I'm hearing it a lot. And I'm like, OK, not everybody can have that problem. And not everybody does, but a lot of folks will say pelvic health to anything that attaches to the pelvic. So saying like bowel health. I see a lot of folks with IBS or IBSD, IBSC. Let's manage your constipation. This is where we kind of talked earlier about nutrition. Let's talk about nutrition. What are you eating? What are you drinking? Are you leaking because you're drinking sodas all day? Wait a minute, seltzers? wait a minute. Leaking? 
bowel movements leaking? Yes. So fecal oh boy. incontinence. Ooh. And and it's present in this world. And a lot of folks, you know, they'll go to their GI and their GI is like, I don't know what to do to your kegels and send them on their way. And I'm like, let's talk about this stuff. That's a problem. That's a like problem. That, that's like, that. That's that definitely need help. Well, good. Yes. And so, and then there's different types of urinary incontinence, whether it's stress incontinence or urge incontinence. And there's you know, we as physical therapists can dive into this a little bit more and we have time to be able to address these topics. And I feel totally comfortable talking about poopy and sex all day. So usually Clearly. I'm, I know, right. I'm here for you guys. You guys had no clue you were getting into this. Didn't well, you? oh, I, I knew it was going to be something. Cause I'm like, I'm like, when Siri can't tell me anything about it, I'm going to have a lot of questions here. Yeah. Um, okay. So because a lot of the people listening are athletes and I have heard this from athletes that I've coached before, I've had women who were on their bike for, you know, long rides and they got off and they could not urinate. So most of the time that is a tightness issue. Okay. Because they've been one sitting on the space and those muscles are tight against the seat, no matter mm -hmm. what saddle you had. And we talked about saddles earlier and there's just no comfortable saddle out there. I don't know who you talk to. No, but, I, I don't think there is a comfortable yeah, seat. And no matter how much money you pay on a saddle, you're still going to have saddle sore or whatever it may be. It's just manage it it's just where yeah just yeah but I mean from a from a muscular standpoint though sometimes if the seat really does not fit you well you can have like that problem with where she couldn't pee I've had men obviously you know have numbness mm -hmm. numbness is not good for a man no so some obviously a lot of saddles will have like the offloading piece to it to unload your pudendal nerve which is a nerve in the testicular perineal region, which comes from S2, S3, S4. So it does come from your sacral, sacral spine, but you're putting pressure rate right on the ischial tuberosities, which is where the pudendal nerve comes up and around. Oh. So it's truly a pudendal neuralgia is what they're experiencing. And you see it a lot of times in men where they'll get testicular pain, one-sided versus the other, and we need to offload that, but we also need to teach them how to relax their pelvic floor. And so I can say, yeah, relax all day, but let's talk to you more about what that means. Let's work on breath work to lengthen that. Let's talk about belly breathing. Let's talk about how can you offload a little bit in your seated position. Um, let's talk about stretches, you know, that you can do prior to getting on the, on the saddle so that we can actually relax those muscles. Wow. Okay. So that's, I mean, that's really important stuff. Yeah. Because I've heard of people having all these issues, but honestly, I was just kind of like, okay, well, you know, that seat's not going to be good for you then. <laughs> but I didn't know that there was actual, you know, medical help that they could get. So that's, that's very good to know. Yeah. So, and then I'll see like an aging population as well. So you talked about the athletes that you have. They could be young athletes who, you know, you see that may have SI joint pain. Obviously that attaches to the pelvis. That's something that we see. Um, but even your aging female population who start to get into perimenopause and menopause. So I kind of really have a passion for that because I think there's a hormonal component to a lot of things that we experience as aging women. So when you go through menopause, you're losing bone health, you have cardiac issues, there's vaginal dryness, there's hormone swings, there's hot sweats, there's a lot to go with that. But there's a lot of research coming out about hormonal replacement therapies that are safe to be used. And so it's not just, hey, I'm getting older, I can't be sexually active with my spouse. Like it's something that we need to be take, talking about and taking care of as we age, not just from a women's perspective, but a men's perspective as and well. And that's something you can do with pelvic health too, So or address at least so in your clinic. I think the biggest thing that I can be helpful for from a menopausal perspective is, hey, let's talk to your OBGYN about a vaginal estrogen cream. Let's talk about if it's a, what we call is dyspareunia. It's a vaginal uh, pain with penetration. Again, whether it's a tampon or a pelvic exam or intercourse with your spouse, let's talk about those muscles. Are they tight? Are they loose? Are you having something descend down through the vagina that we need to use vaginal estrogen cream in that space to help, I call it bulk up the tissue so that something doesn't fall down and you don't feel like some you're sitting on a golf ball all the time. So, so that's what it might feel like for a woman. Yes. So vaginal pelvic organ prolapse can be divided into two things. So you can have anterior wall prolapse, which is where the bladder or the uterus or cervix descend down, or you can have what's called as a posterior wall prolapse, which is where the rectum actually descends down, which is usually um, related to chronic constipation. 
So you talk about some of this stuff that can be preventable, but hey, let's talk about constipation now. Yeah. And let's talk about what you're eating. Are you having enough fiber? Are you drinking enough water? Are you moving? Like these are just simple So that things can that all can lead into rectocele's or vaginal wall prolapses. So, I mean, not that anybody can see me, but my mouth is just hanging open because I'm like, oh my gosh, like this, this stuff is like, wow, ow. Oh my gosh, it's bad. <laughs> um, sorry, it's, I know you talk about it all the time, but like for me over here, non-medical, I'm like, oh, I'm just imagining. But you also take care of yourself. But that I doesn't. Try. But that doesn't mean that you're susceptible to any of this either, because of a menopausal component. There you go. Yeah. So, but even my postpartum women who want to get back into things like there's a hormonal component to being postpartum and also if you're breastfeeding. So you're going to have some hormonal deficits because of that, almost like you were postmenopausal as well. Right. But there's a lot of help out there when it comes to that. So just knowing that pelvic floor health and pelvic health itself can be um, of benefit for someone, again, preventative or proactive rather than reactive. And I think that's why it's being such a buzzword. Yeah, right that's now. what I was going to ask is, is, is this something that is, that is more, you have a problem, you come see you, or is there the component to it of, no, come see me and I can help you not experience some of these things? I think both. Yeah. So I think ne- right now what we're seeing is there's a buzzword with pelvic health. So I'm seeing a lot of younger folks, which is great. So I'm seeing women six weeks postpartum. I'm seeing women who just found out they're pregnant who want to have a good delivery. Oh, and that's so great. so we talk about birth plan and we talk about how to push. We talk about different positions. We talk about how to be able to take care of your low back during pregnancy. It's not just this, hey, you're pregnant, you're going to have low back pain. No, it's, hey, let's do some manual work on your low back. Let's give you some core exercises so that you can feel stable within your pelvis as pregnancy progresses. And let's talk about your birth plan, whether that's a midwife, whether that is an OBGYN, whether that's a hospital birth, whatever that is for you. Let's make sure that you're like truly educated um, in the knowledge that you have going into these deliveries. But what I see a lot of times, too, is these folks come in and they're like, I'm going to have a vaginal delivery and I'm not going to have an epidural. And I'm like, that's awesome. I love that birth plan for you. And then they come back to me and they're like, I had a C-section. And I'm like, that's great. I am so happy for you because you had a healthy delivery. So I don't want people to feel like they came in with this one expectation and come out with a C-section. It doesn't matter if you had a C-section or a vaginal delivery pelvic floor therapy can be extremely helpful for you. So you say, yeah, I had a C-section yeah, delivery. I wanted, but I was like, I want to have everything all natural. I was like, I'm all for it. And then my doctor said the baby's upside down. And I was like, and he's like, but I can turn it. And I was like, you can turn the baby? Sorry. I, I just didn't know a lot about stuff like this. And I'm like, I didn't, how do you turn a baby that's going, you know, feet first? How do you put its head up? And he was like, well, we give you an epidural and I stick my hand. And I was like, Mm-mm. well, I'm friends with him. And I was like, yeah, we're not doing that. We are not doing that. We're not going to still be friends after that. So I was like, just sign me up for the C-section yeah, because ultimately the baby could turn back and yep. I wanted a healthy baby yeah. more than I wanted a natural delivery. So, you know, it didn't really matter. I know a lot about these things. I, I'm sure you do. You are probably <laughs> an expert. I'm an Outside. expert. Times yeah. five. I was going to say you yeah. have lots of children. Yeah. 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 So, um, so, so these are very personal things. And, and I've, I talked to many people in healthcare fields and when they're, when they're dealing with those things that are very personal things, they always talk about how, how do we get, how do we not the stigma is the wrong word. Maybe it's the right word of how do we get people past that barrier of being willing to come and talk about this? And because there's probably people even now listening that like, Hey, this is something I need to explore. I was like, but gosh, I don't want to like show up and like, Hey, I want to, but she's a doctor. I she's, she's a doctor. A doctor. I know, so she you know she's a doctor. You okay. can tell her anything. Okay. I know that. But I think there's confidence in the experience. So I've done this six of my 10 years as a physical therapist. And this is something that I do on a daily basis. I'm most, I, w- I would say I'm very intuitive in kind of people's body language. So, hey, you're coming in for urinary leakage. Let's talk about a couple of other things that lead into that. And let's talk about, you know, do, can we talk about what you drink? How often do you go to the bathroom? And again, like it, people have told me things that they don't tell their spouses. And I feel that that's just 
maybe a little bit of my confidence going into the conversation and it's a very closed door environment that I'm not going to communicate with anybody else about these problems that they're experiencing. But you'll find that the ones who experience pain with sex or pain with intercourse, they're tired of it. Their spouse is tired of it. Um, and they just want to be able to be intimate with each other. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times I'll include the spouse if the patient is willing and they're usually very supportive. So I think it's confidence in my ability to be able to say, Hey, there is a, there's a fix to this problem. We can help manage this without a medication or without a surgery. And yeah. I think that's what most people come in saying is, do I have to get a sling? Do I have to get a tuck? Do oh. I have to start a medication again, in I'm order to be here. able to do this? Just yeah. uh, like, oh no. Okay. And, and again, there's conservative methods. And you talked about people having a proactive experience versus a reactive experience. Again, I'm seeing a lot of folks who are younger postpartum patients who are starting to work on this and starting to actually do something about it rather than saying, okay, I have a 70 year old, you know, grandmother who is now having prolapse issues. And she's saying to me, I was never given this opportunity to be able to do this. I wish I had done this decades ago. So I think we're starting to see a shift in change of um, prioritizing women's and men's health, because I do see men with testicular pain or with, you know, the the thing that we'll mostly see actually is stress incontinence after a prostatectomy, which is they have prostate surgery, they'll get their prostate removed, which actually removes about an inch and a half of the urethra and makes them very susceptible to urinary leakage. And so we'll say, hey, let's teach you to use your backup system of your pelvic floor to be able to reduce your leak with coughing, laughing, sneezing. Let's get you back on the bike so you can walk or you can bike or whatever without having the fear of leakage from an emotional or social perspective. So I think the biggest thing is my confidence in being able to say, I'm willing and open to talk to you about this whenever you're ready and just know that there's some help out there. And pelvic floor, like you said, is becoming more of a, uh, not a fad, but it's a talk. You hear We're about talking it. about it more. But, I, but, you know, yeah, I've heard about it. I've heard a lot about pelvic floor, this pelvic floor, that. But honestly, I didn't know anything about it until you just went over everything. And I, I mean, I'm still just amazed at how much, uh, what a big area it covers mm -hmm. And how many different things it covers and how many things that probably lots of people have those issues didn't even know that there was a way to solve it without, you know, having some sort of surgery. So I think that's pretty awesome. Thank you for sharing it all with us, even though I'm standing over here going, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Wow. And, and again, sometimes it takes a lot of time, like you said, for people to actually make their way to me. But a lot of times people will go to their OBGYN and say, hey, I'd like a referral to see a pelvic floor therapist in my area. And who do you recommend? And definitely in the Spartanburg area, th this has been something of my passion is to bring the pelvic floor or pelvic health niche to Spartanburg. Not to say Greenville is oversaturated, but I think being from Spartanburg and wanting more access to resources in Spartanburg, I think that's why I've opened the clinic in Spartanburg with Limitless Pelvic Health to be able to access the folks who come from Gre um, from Gaffney, from Union, from Spartanburg. And I think that we deserve as much of a pelvic floor niche or specialization as Greenville folks do. So I think that was my biggest passion is just to be able to serve those folks who still need this type of care um, in my local area. Yeah, well, I mean, this is – it's been a fascinating conversation, and I, I I think about things like this as as I don't say as we evolve, but as as we learn more and more, you know, there's more and more things that we can do to optimize our lives. And um, I would kind of characterize what you're doing as one of those things that that you can you can do it again without without turning to you know, and, there, and there's nothing wrong. I mean, I think. You know, there's there's drugs out there that can help us for specific things, but um, I believe it's always a good thing to explore the options of how do we optimize our bodies to help us and and help us help optimize our lives. And and it sounds like that's something that you're you're doing yeah. and, and helping helping people with. And so where where can people find you? Where can they contact you if they're interested? And we'll put all this in the show notes as well. But where tell, tell them where your offices are, how they can get in touch with you, uh, website, anything that you want to share. 
Yeah. So I work for Limitless Therapy and Wellness and I'm under the the pelvic health side of it. We do have orthopedic therapists um, who obviously specialize in more orthopedic, you know, ACLs and kind of stuff. Not to say I can't do that, but there are better people at that than I am. And I'm you sure were they bored wouldn't. By, you were bored by that. Yeah, so well, now you're doing this. That's I don't what think you they said. would want to do what I do. So <laughs> um, I think it's reciprocal. So we have two offices in Greenville, one on Toy Street near the um, zoo. And then one on Woodruff Road, which is more of kind of like our orthopedic um, mothership is what we call it. And then I just opened the clinic in Spartanburg, which is in the Labors of Love Midwifery Birth Center. So it's actually been a really cool eye-opening experience for me to have some space within the birth center where folks and families will come to deliver their babies at the birth center and leave hours later. Oh, wow. So it's not how I chose to do my deliveries, and I think that's fine. Everybody kind of has a different birth plan, but it's been really an interesting collaboration with the midwives to be able to work with them. So I'm on the east side of town. Um, It's 850 Floyd Road Extension in the Labors of Love Midwifery Birth Center, and you can... Look us up online at the um, limitless therapy and wellness.com and just call Anna or Jordan, our kind of people who help run our, our um, referrals and kind of get you placed with the appropriate therapist. And then you go from there. So they'll kind of onboard you from there as to whether you need more orthopedic care or if you live in Greenville versus Spartanburg. So, but I'm, I'm taking patients in Spartanburg, building a caseload and starting up a new clinic, but just using my background and experience, I think is the biggest thing. And then just providing really good quality of care to folks who find value in their pelvic health. So I think that's the biggest thing moving forward. Well, you're, you're very passionate about it. And, and any healthcare professional that I've been involved with that has made the biggest difference, the biggest differences in my life have been people that have been very passionate about what they're doing and helping people to, to get better and become healthier. And it's very obvious that you have that passion. So um, kudos to you yeah. and, and this education that you've given us. And I, Coach Katie, I took this much better than you did. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, but knowledge is power, right? Yes. So yeah. like now I know and I'm like, wow, okay. You know, if somebody is telling me they're having this problem, I can suggest they come see you word of mouth is really powerful and experience and good quality care especially in the healthcare field goes a long way well I always feel like you know if I were to send you an athlete like they get that little bit extra because you're also an athlete and I just always think that's important I want to send people to people that I know or people I would go to Mm -hmm. yeah well I think we can we will put all of her information in the show notes would encourage you to, if this is something that has even piqued your interest, to reach out and and see. And I would imagine that there's probably people you see that's like, hey, look, there's this probably is not the thing for you, and um, and that's okay too. But we would just encourage you to to reach out. This is someone that is very passionate about helping people and passionate about this subject. And so we would just encourage you to to reach out to her and see if if her and her team there can can help you with with these things. And so. Great to have you on. We encourage you to go back. The The last podcast uh, talked about her journey, her journey with running and just many different things. We got into talking about parenting and other things. So if you want to learn a little bit more about her personally, go back to the last podcast and um, that'll probably just reaffirm that you, if you're dealing with any of these issues, that she would probably be a good person to reach out to that can probably help you. So for Jed Blackwell, Coach Katie Malone, and Dr. Morgan over here, It's Kevin Harrison signing off, and we just remind you, do the hard things today, and tomorrow will take care of itself.